Chemotherapy really means uh, any type of drug treatment. It has come to be universally referred to anti-cancer therapy, but it really could be any kind of drug treatment. And for a drug to be effective, it must reach the tumor cells, and the tumor cells must be sensitive to the drug. And so you have certainly heard a lot, I think, in the lay press recently about the uh, ability to design drugs that might target specific tumor types, and we're going to come to that. The drug also must have what we call acceptable toxicity, recognizing that what we may find acceptable, you may not find acceptable. Um, but it certainly cannot seriously harm the brain or the rest of the body. Now, um, the brain, as I mentioned before, is, has a unique anatomy, but it also has a unique physiology. And it has something called the blood-brain barrier. Um, which is a normal st structure, it's both a structure and a function, if you will, that is designed to protect the brain. It's really designed to keep toxins out of the brain. So as the blood circulates throughout your body and to the brain as well as all the other organs, um, it can carry things that are not necessarily uh, good for you, and you, the body has developed this mechanism to keep them uh, from keep the brain from being exposed to those kinds of toxins. Um, and if you want to think about chemotherapy, it is like a toxin. So it is going to be normally excluded from the normal brain structures in, with most drugs. Now, gliomas, particularly the high-grade or malignant gliomas, disrupt the blood-brain barrier. And they do so in a variety of ways, including by forming new blood vessels that do not possess a blood-brain barrier. So they have abnormal blood vessels that are leaky and permeable. The drugs can penetrate into the tumor better. So actually, in the area of the tumor that we see on an MRI, um, many of the drugs that don't ordinarily get into the brain will get into that region of tumor. However, as Dr. Guten has already described how these tumors are infiltrative, around the margins, the, t the drugs will frequently be excluded from those areas. So the blood-brain barrier is, uh, can be a challenge. Now, most chemotherapy drugs that are available commercially in the market have actually been developed for other tumor types, breast, lung, colon, et cetera. And part of that is just the reality that those tumors are much more common than brain tumors. And most conventional drugs, chemotherapy drugs, block processes that lead the uh, cell to divide. And these are normal processes that are present and active in normal cells as well as the tumor cells. And that's why you can get side effects. And in particular, things like the bone marrow and the GI tract, which are dividing frequently, are most easily affected by these drugs, leading to problems with blood counts and sometimes things like nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. And many conventional drugs can be ineffective against brain tumors, not because they cannot reach the tumor because of the barrier, but because the tumor cells are intrinsically resistant to the drug and not sensitive to it. Now, temozolomide is the first really conventional type of chemotherapeutic drug that was really developed for brain tumors. It is unquestionably the most effective agent that we have in our conventional armamentarium. It doubled the two-year survival for patients with glioblastoma when it was administered concurrently with radiation, as Dr. Beal was mentioning. That means during the same time as radiotherapy and in what we call the adjuvant setting, meaning after radiation therapy is completed. So when it's combined in that way, we have been able to double the two-year survival. This is really the first advance in the treatment of these kinds of tumors at, in more than 30 years, just to put this in perspective. There are other conventional agents that we use to treat brain tumors. So the nitrosoureas, either BCNU or CCNU, procarbazine, carboplatin, irinotecan, or CPT-11 are really just um, a few of them. But none of them are particularly effective. They may be effective for individuals, but as a group, they're not that 
potent. Increasingly, an effort has been made throughout all of oncology to develop what we call targeted therapy. Now, these are drugs designed to interfere with the abnormal pathways that define a cancer cell. So just by definition, a cancer cell is not like a normal cell. It has uncontrolled cell division and tends to um, avoid uh, the ability to, to commit suicide, basically, which many of our uh, cells do on a daily basis, which allows us to renew our body and keep it healthy. The cancer cell has figured out ways around that, and those abnormal pathways are now the targets of many drugs. So this requires, by definition, knowledge of what the basic molecular features are of the tumor type, meaning this particular tumor, what makes it tick, um, what are the growth factors that are causing it to grow, which is a big target, and also a, a recent target are the blood vessels that sustain the growth of a tumor, because a tumor cannot grow without a blood supply. Just like all their normal organs require a blood supply for growth, so does your tumor. Um, and this is a very complicated and heterogeneous issue. And this is a kind of a cartoon that's actually simplified but gives you some idea of the complexity of things. So this is a growth factor pathway. And this horizontal line is supposed to be the cell membrane. So this is the cancer cell. This is outside the cell and this is inside the cell. And this thing straddling the membrane is called the epidermal growth factor receptor, uh, which is a common growth factor receptor in many tissues in the body and is activated by the epidermal growth factor, which is can be made by the tumor cells. And then this leads to this complicated cascade that happens inside the cell that ultimately winds up telling the cell, divide, 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 uncontrollably and con constantly. These blue boxes are drugs that have been designed. Some of them are available on the market. Others are uh, in, in development that interfere or block this pathway at various points along, uh, along the way. Now, it would seem as though this is pretty straightforward, you know, turn things off, turn, turn off the spout at the top and turn off the pathway. Well, I really wish it were that simple. Um, but that was the original concept, and a lot of effort went into developing inhibitors of the epidermal growth factor receptor, inhibitors of all types. The drug Tarceva or uh, Erlotinib, which is available commercially for lung cancer, uh, was certainly studied in brain tumors. And while brain tumors, or malignant gliomas in particular, are um, activated by the epidermal growth factor in at least 60% of patients, these inhibitors had very disappointing results, whereas we had been very hopeful that it was going to be um, useful. Now, the reason for the disappointment, well, the reason for the disappointment is clear, but the reason for the uh, inactivity w uh, turned out to be very complicated. So in some circumstances, um, the drugs actually didn't turn off the signaling, even though they were supposed to. Um, and other times, even when we turned off the signaling at the top, somehow the pathway was still active and going. Um, and because this is because they're extremely redundant, uh, complicated, and there's many more than a single growth factor um, that is, are active here. So then the logical conclusion is, well, maybe we need to hit multiple tar targets, and that's part of what these blue boxes are about. Well, if we turn things off from the top and the bottom, do we do a better job? And um, this is an area of very active uh, investigation that we're participating in. And I would like to just share with you um, pictures from a single person who did have an epidermal growth factor receptor and an experimental drug that turned off the signaling uh, down inside the cell. Um, and this uh, person had a recurrent uh, glioblastoma. These are all pictures from one person. And actually, when we used combination therapy, we really had a very dramatic and gratifying response, um, leading us to think that, well, clearly, we need to do hit more than one target. Um, unfortunately, while this was 
uh, a very impressive response. It didn't last anywhere near as long as we had hoped. So clearly more work needs to be done. And we actually do have a number of trials exploring this that Dr. Omoro will discuss later today. Now, I do want to spend the last few minutes on anti-angiogenesis th um, drugs. So malignant brain tumors have uh, a lot of uh, VEGF. VEGF is vascular endothelial growth factor, one of the many growth factors the tumor produces. Endothelial cells are blood vessel cells. They're not tumor cells. So this is a way that the tumor is guaranteeing its survival by making factors that will stimulate a blood supply to support it. So these endothelial cells divide, migrate, and grow and form new blood vessels. Bevacizumab, or Avastin, is a drug that targets VEGF. It's not the only drug. There are many, actually, out there. But it is the furthest along in development, and it is a monoclonal antibody that decreases blood vessel growth in tumors. And it's already been approved for use in lung, colon, and breast cancer, where, in general, it works in conjunction with chemotherapy. And I think it's on its way to being approved for brain tumors. Now, this is a cartoon that, actually, I took from Genentech that makes uh, of Aston. And this little um, yellow blob is supposed to be the tumor making the VEGF, this green uh, ball, uh, which is a growth factor that's stimulating. These are supposed to be normal blood vessels um, in tissue next to the tumor. And this VEGF stimulates these blood vessels to grow, and you can see how they're growing into the tumor. And only when this happens can the tumor really grow to a significant size. And you can see all kinds of vessels coming from all directions, including the sprouting of completely new vessels, coming to feed this thing. And as it's growing and getting bigger, it's kind of spreading out into the tissue. So Avastin in glioblastoma has been sort of the next wave of promising therapy. Um, it clearly reduces the tumor size on the MRI in about 60% of people with recurrent disease, which is really quite a remarkable number. It doesn't work in everyone. Clearly, there's 40% in whom it doesn't work. And we don't know why uh, those 40% are not sensitive to Avastin. It clearly prolongs survival after, the to after glioblastoma has recurred and can actually double uh, survival. Um, however, patients still wind up having the tumor grow back, although at a later time. And it can change the growth pattern of the tumor itself over time. And this is something we've really grown to appreciate uh, recently, and it's very, very challenging sometimes to figure out, actually, whether Avastin is even working, and I'm going to show you a picture of that. Sometimes it's very straightforward. Here's a, a, a glioblastoma and on Avastin, and you see it's much better. That's straightforward. This is not so straightforward. This is a person who had an uh, enhancing tumor here and was started on Avastin, and the enhancement disappears. And you say, OK, this is great. This is good. But on different kinds of sequences of MRI, we see this white area, which sort of signifies the infiltrative tissue. And yet, while the enhancement has disappeared, look at what has happened here, where this much larger area, even perhaps crossing to the other side, is now involved by infiltrative tumor. Um, and this we're seeing in some people on Avastin, and really, uh, this is an area that we really need to work on to understand what is happening. And we know, actually, that this is tumor because we have operated on some of these pa people, and under the microscope we can see that it's infiltrative disease. So what about anti-angiogenic agents? It's an incredibly promising new approach. Um, Dr. Beal uh, mentioned to you some of our uh, latest work in which we're combining it with radiation therapy, but I don't think it's yet um, a panacea. It can help to restore the blood-brain barrier, decrease enhancement. It definitely decreases edema and swelling and reduces steroids, and in some patients, regresses tumor. It's not yet clear 
whether combining it with chemotherapy actually is any better than using it alone. So that leaves us, I think, actually um, on a positive note in the sense that the amount of work and research to help understand what's going on here um, really gives us a lot of optimism for the development of new therapies. Gliomas are, have never been treat, uh, more treatable than they are now, and I think as we develop molecularly-based therapies that we will be able to do an even better job and overcome the blood-brain barrier as well.